Support for Carolina Business Review provided by Grant Thornton. Operating in more than 100 countries, our tax, audit, and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv. And by Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. We're full steam ahead. Despite turmoil in intermodal facilities and debates over running of airports, companies continue to select the Carolinas for headquarters, manufacturing plants, back office support, data centers, and more. But it's not just our infrastructure, the workforce, or the tax incentives that's caught their eye. Welcome, thank you for tuning in to the most widely watched program on Carolina business and public policy. I'm Dr. Cheryl Richards, filling in for Chris William, and today's conversation is about more than industrial steam. It's about economic steam. Economic steam gained back by putting the arts back in conversations around science, technology, engineering, and math. Across the Carolinas, the arts play an essential role within our educational system, our quality of life, and as an economic driver for vitality. In a moment, we turn to our panelists who have strong opinions about funding, legislation, incentives, and new partnerships that will ensure future sustainability of the arts as we steam ahead. Major funding also by Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. And by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina, who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. This edition of Carolina Business Review was recorded June 14th, 2013. On this week's program, John Boyer of the Beckler Museum of Modern Art, Carlos Evans, Spoleto Festival USA, Todd McDonald of Clemson University, and Dr. Lawrence Wheeler of the North Carolina Museum of Art. Welcome, gentlemen. We have an exciting conversation today. We're full steam ahead talking about economic vitality by putting the A back in all this conversation about STEM. But let's not jump right into that full steam ahead. Um, you know, we were supposed to be joined by uh, Ken May, South Carolina Commissioner of the Arts, who has been called away to the uh, State House to talk budgets. So why don't we talk budgets? Let's start talking budgets, and uh, maybe later you can. Yeah, I, in. I'd love to talk budget. <laughs> <laughs> But for the grace of God, I might be at the legislature too, except they're not meeting on Friday. But, uh, you know, it's quite a different um, uh, posture uh, that North Carolina has as contrasted with South Carolina in terms of funding for the arts. Uh, even with a new administration in Raleigh, there's a great sensitivity to funding for the arts. And while they're looking for cuts everywhere, they have not cut the arts disproportionately. They have not singled out the arts. And I think it's because we believe in North Carolina that the arts are part of our core values. The arts are important in our communities. Artists are important in our communities, in our lives. And arts institutions are important for delivering the best creative quality that uh, can be found in the world. Yeah. And we think those things are important. And as a result, our legislators believe they are important. Now, it doesn't mean that they won't get in there and they'll cut away at uh, certain points. So we've been in a cutting posture with the Senate budget, and then now it's gone to the House, and the House budget's come out, and the House budget's been very kind to the arts. So it's Great. sort of reversed the Senate projections on cuts, and more understanding has uh, come to bear. Uh, so we're very hopeful that uh, with the Art Museum, uh, for example, you want to talk about public-private partnerships. All of us represent uh, some more private than public. I represent 70% private. 30% uh, public. One thinks that the North Carolina Museum of Art is all taken care of uh, by state dollars, but uh, not so. 
Uh, we have a $16 million budget and only $5 million of that comes from the state of North Carolina. That's very yeah. important. But, you know, we have great friends and corporations and foundations and people who support us and we've found ways to earn money. And, you know, it's really important to understand that the future of the arts depend upon this type of partnership. You know, I think you, you've opened the door for the public-private partnership, so I'm going to look at this side of the table because that's where you live, right? You're not successful for 37 years without some private help. No question. Uh, I'm originally a South Carolinian, so I have a sincere interest in South Carolina. Um, in my everyday life and in my real job, I'm a banker, so I'm very concerned with economic development, and I believe that the quality of life is a big factor in why companies choose to locate to a particular area or why they choose to add jobs in a particular area. And make no mistake about it, uh, one of the key factors in the quality of life is the quality of the arts and the quality of health and human services. So to me, it's really simple. An investment in uh, arts groups is really an investment in economic uh, development because you're impacting the quality of the life in, in your community or your, or your state. So you're saying we can only work so many hours a day, we have to have a balance to that. I think you have to have a balance. I think, you know, certainly people look at infrastructure when they choose to relocate, they look at taxes, they want to know are your roads good, or your schools good, but make no mistake about it, they also want to know is the quality of life there, and arts groups have a very, very heavy and important influence on quality of life. Mm -hmm. I think there's another aspect, too, about arts that helps develop the community that gets overlooked quite often. Um, if you think about, you know, if you're going to spend a night going out to the arts and enjoying the great programming that a venue can operate, um, you know, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to put gas in your car, right? And then you're going to go to that venue and you're going to enjoy art, and it's probably going to be for free. And the people who made it aren't getting paid, and the people who, um, you know, are, are operating the venue are operating often, very often at a loss. Um, you know, they might be operating with um, some, some public funds, but they also probably are getting some private funds. And then they're also having to deal with their operating funds to, to help make ends meet. Um, and, you know, you think about after you go to this, this art opening, you're probably going to go out to dinner. And you might even go get a beer somewhere. And so if you think about it, that there are these arts districts all over, you know, the United States, and especially in South Carolina, and I visit them often, and um, you get to see that this whole community actually benefits from an arts district, you know, that it, it gets people out in the community, it gets people spending money. Um, and so I think it makes a lot of sense, you know, for the community to sort of think about, like, if we've got these community members that are helping draw people into our community and they're, they're spending their money while we're here, um, you know, maybe it might make sense to figure out ways to keep them afloat and keep them going. Well, Charlotte has a great example, you know, with the Beckler and the Met and the concentration of really very high quality um, arts resources gathered together in the center of downtown Charlotte. You know, what a statement it, sa it makes mm -hmm. about the commitment of Charlotte to things that are important in people's lives. And to mix that into the urban energy of the city is just a great example. And, of course, John is one mm -hmm. of the engineers of that. <laughs> well, <clears throat> it's kind of a latecomer to an idea that I think could have only been born when it was born. This was very much a pre-recession uh, challenge that Charlotte had given itself. And it's very much a public-private. It's the city, the county, the state all had to take formal votes to support the financial apparatus that made this entire entity uh, possible. But it was really Wachovia, now Wells Fargo, who took the lead on this as the property developer. Almost a billion dollars worth of capital investments. So think about all the jobs and the ripple effect there in terms of economic development. Um, and you've had four acres of land developed with four cultural nonprofits with commercial and street retail. It's really a remarkably successful and now widely recognized experiment that just happened to be here in North Carolina. Another great thing to be proud of when it comes to the mixture of business and the arts. And you've both made very important points about attracting businesses here, but I think it's also keeping businesses here. The retention mm -hmm. of that workforce, especially as we focus more and more attention on the creative class. So if you want that 30-something code writer, if you want that financial analyst, if you want, you know, those kinds of people are <coughs> eager for the kinds of opportunities that we can provide them. And it's essential if you want to keep them here in the Carolinas, then we need to have these kinds of opportunities. And the other thing, it's not only folks from town going downtown or wherever to, it's the tourism impact. 
This is real money that comes into the Carolinas from all across the country and all around the world, and that's all fresh money. Uh, and so much of that is being driven by not only the natural splendor of the Carolinas and the beaches and the mountains, but it's the cultural experiences that people can have in history, in the fine arts, and the performing arts. And so it's an essential driver for our, our economy. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would just echo something John said. I, I know at Spoleto we sell 70,000 tickets a year, and half of those, fully half of those, are from people from outside of South Carolina. So many people get introduced to Charleston for the first time through Spoleto, and when they come for the first time, they obviously like what they see. Charleston is now the number one uh, tourist destination uh, as advertised by Condé Nast, and they return. They come and they experience, and then they come back, and uh, some of them buy homes, and some of them choose to move there permanently. Well, let me just add on to that anecdote, if it is, <laughs> uh, because when the museum, for example, in Raleigh uh, does a Rembrandt exhibition, or it does a Monet exhibition, both of uh, which we presented in the last uh, few years, we are able to draw people from all 50 states, from all 100 counties in North Carolina, and often between 30 and 50 foreign countries. So we are bringing people from all over the world and all over the United States and all over, all over the state and all over the region to Raleigh, to the museum. Now, they might be in Raleigh for something else, but they are from these places, and they are in Raleigh, and they rent hotels, and they go out to eat, and they do all the things that you say they do, and we measure that impact. You know, We want to know, you know that we have produced a very solid multi-million dollar, tens of millions of dollars each time that we do this into the local tourism economy. So let's talk about it. It's great. So we say we have a vibrant, healthy community now. How do we sustain that going forward? We have to dig deep back into the younger generation, right? So how do we encourage uh, young people to get involved in the arts? I'm going to look to you first. <laughs> well, I think obviously through education, um, you know, and I think that people who are, um, are, are, are provoked to participate in the arts get a really well-rounded education um, that I think makes them think about things in a different way. Um, you know, it's been proven that, you know, people who, who take music have higher scores in math. Um, you know, we understand that, you know, that there's this great emphasis going on right now in science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, but if you think about it, a lot of those 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 types of subject matters deal in in really quantifiable, measurable, um, you know, products and relationships, and I think the arts, you know, actually arts and humanities add uh, another type of question to the equation that really um, acknowledges the fact that we're all human beings, you know, and that there's a need to um, think about, you know, not only like what is this form that's being constructed through through math and science, but what does it mean? And um, what does it mean socially? What does it mean culturally? What does it mean economically? What does it mean politically? How does it make you feel? You know, um, I think that all these yeah. different kinds of questions, you know, are, are the kinds of questions that actually make people excited and that they're, you know, realizing that these esoteric subjects like math and science, you know, um, actually are applicable in their everyday lives, you know, and, and that they feel like they have a connection with it. John? former arts instructor, want to weigh in? <laughs> well, well, I would, and I think, too, that uh, all of us in our own way still are arts instructors, of course. We just mm -hmm. have a different instrument to use. And whether it's a painting studio or a great museum or performing arts, I think that we're all still teachers in our own way, if I might. Uh, I think, too, that for, for so many young people, to get them engaged, young people, maybe like all of us, but especially young people, they're trying to find their own voice. They're trying to figure out who they are, their place in the world, the role that they have what they can bring to the table, what they can discover once they get there. You know, the, the property of empathy, to be able to see the world through another's eyes. All of these things are absolutely fundamental to character building. And so if we believe, as a people, as states, that that's an essential element in an informed citizenry, then the arts play a very important role there, too. It's not only math and science and engineering technology, although it is all of that, but it's that leavening quality that makes all of those things come more fully to life with a, a well-rounded individual. And, and it can really, I think, only happen in the arts. So I, may, I mean, this may be the explosive 
question then to put on the table. So how do you combat this uh, utopian society uh, viewpoint that we've just expressed here with what happens in Raleigh or what happens in DC for funding? And uh, let me ask the reactions to Governor McCrory's comments about um, maybe a liberal arts education not having quite the value as an engineering degree. I think it, first of all, may have been unintentionally illuminating uh, mm -hmm. as to the view that the governor has about the role of, of the arts. And, and frankly, I think he may have wished to restate it, <laughs> likely, uh, and I think has done so since. Uh, after all, he was the mayor of Charlotte when this extraordinary thing happened that we just talked about, uh, the development of the Louisiana <laughs> Center for the Arts. Um, so he understands the value, both economically, uh, culturally, educationally, without a doubt. I think the question is, in a period where there are so many constraints on revenues that are available to meet the needs across the entire budget system for the state, tough questions have to be asked. I would argue, however, that they can be more than adequately answered by leaders in our field and by leaders in the educational field to make that case that if you want all the rest of the budget to work long term, you need to keep making this investment now in the short term for the arts. I think the key word there is long term. You know, when we think about, I think any kind of responsible educator thinks out to the future and they think about, um, you know, what are we teaching to and what are the arts students going to do um, out in the future? And I think that it's pretty obvious that, um, you know, the, the climate that we exist in is, is actually changing really rapidly, right? If you think about what life was like 10 years ago and what it's like right now and what it's going to be like in 10 more years. Um, I think the truth of the matter is that we don't actually know exactly what our lives are going to be like in 10 years. And so I think that that necessitates um, having a student who actually is really well informed and has a full education and understands and has the capacity to um, be able to solve problems that don't necessarily already have a, a, an obvious uh, predicated answer available to them. Um, you know, and through, yeah. through the liberal arts um, and through having a, a well-rounded education, I think that you learn to be a problem solver um, and that it's not just about sort of, you know, taking care of, of the known quantities, but also, you know, being able to sort of view something um, and figure out the unknowns. Well, it is that mm -hmm. balance between the qualitative and the quantitative, isn't it? You really need to have both to arrive at the, the end result I think we're all looking for. Um, so I couldn't agree more, absolutely. I think it's interesting, these 10 years that you point to, just 10 years. Uh, 10 years ago, we were just coming into the 21st century. And uh, you know what? We talk about the arts differently in the 21st century than we did in the 20th century. There's been a lot of change. And technology has driven so much of that. You know, every kid's an artist uh, anymore. They, they make art with their... Uh, their phones you know, uh, and with their mm -hmm. iPads and they're thinking artistically and creatively about how the technology that they have available for communications purposes becomes an instrument of creativity. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, they think differently about the world around them and they're, they're beginning to see it a bit differently. And so in terms of the arts as something over here where we used to sort of put it in the 20th century, you don't anymore because the arts are so integrated into life and creativity is so integrated into life. And even cultural institutions like symphony orchestras and theater companies and uh, art museums Hi. and on and on and on realize that they have a responsibility in the community to support the educational mission of that community, to be in the schools and to create programs online and available to teachers, available to students. We're all in this together. And so this integrativeness of the 21st century is one of the great strengths. And I think, you know, we're responding to um, the public will, I mean, and public behavior. Mm -hmm. It's just changed. How has Spoleto changed the conversation? Well, um, I would not want to comment on, on Governor McCrory's statement because I didn't hear it and I didn't know what context it, it was in. But I do know that Governor McCrory has been a huge supporter of the arts. Uh, certainly as mayor of Charlotte, he was. Um, maybe his comment was uh, aimed more at what, what the companies want. And there's no question that today 
uh, companies are looking for uh, future employees with technical skills, with you know specialized degrees. Uh, you know that's just a fact of life, and maybe he was referencing. You know, there's more demand for that than someone uh, with a more general education. I actually went to a liberal arts college, very similar to the one that uh, Governor McCrory went to, and I did okay. So uh, <laughs> I'm not complaining about what it did for me. But um, you know, Spoleto was uh, clearly. Um, you know, a, a very strong part of not only South Carolina, but the Southeast. Uh, if you listen to Mayor Joe Riley in Charleston, South Carolina, he really credits Spoleto with being one of the very, very key things that has turned that city around. Uh, so make no mistake about it, the, the arts have a role in uh, being part of the fabric and quality of every community, whether it's, uh, you know, what Larry does in Raleigh or whether what John does with the Beckler here in Charlotte. And Spoleto has its own role uh, for the Southeast. I do think getting younger people engaged is something that we all have to think about. I'm sure that Larry, John, and others, that we're all thinking about these things. Um, and how I think, do you do that? How do you get Well, I think you have to work it into your programming. Yeah. I think you have to think about can you uh, do special things that appeal to younger people. At Spoleto, we have a group called Scene, which is for younger uh, people to help them uh, get introduced to the arts. Uh, the performances for scene are, are generally more affordable. Uh, they have social functions uh, throughout the year to, to get people involved. So I, th I think one has to, to make a conscious effort to market and to do things and to provide things that appeal to younger people. And to let them drive that machine. I think they know best what kind of experiences they're looking for. And I'm sure Larry has a great apparatus of a similar type at the museum. And we're just now building ours as a young institution. But I think you can trust that younger audience to figure out the best way for them to relate to the services, the, the objects, the experiences that can be provided. And they will. Mm -hmm. They will. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say that, um, you know, I think talking about the media, how things are so media driven these days, um, you know, and, and that the students and, and the young people out there um, who are in the art classes, they are actually, you know, kind of confronting these questions about what, you know, how is social media being used? How is the, um, the sort of character of, of what's happening in media affecting the way we see the world? Um, and so I think that, you know, more so than ever, the visual arts, um, are very important, you know, in terms of, you know, teaching visual literacy. You know, I, I often, you know, talk to my students about how, you know, it's kind of like we all drive cars, but nobody knows how to fix them, right? Well, we all look at media images, but we don't actually know how they work. And when these young folks are, are working in the arts and they start to understand the mechanics of how visual um, media operates and how the way they're looking at it and what they're seeing actually affects the meaning of what they're looking at, you know, they're going to be much more fine tuned. They understand how to operate it. They understand how to interact with it. And they also understand how to be more in control of, you know, how they're representing themselves and what they're going to do in the future with it. Well, for example, the museum just two years ago began a uh, series of online courses for high school students. So through the North Carolina Virtual Public School, uh, students can take online courses and get high school credit, and it gives them that art credit. Mm -hmm. So we're now teaching four courses, and we'll probably add a, a fifth course next year, and I think the courses are photography, game design, So let me go back design. to a, a comment you made earlier about now the arts is no longer sitting out there, but it's integrated there. Mm -hmm. So do we need to continue to integrate the curriculum as opposed to creating magnet schools that are for the arts? Well, Ian, we've got about two minutes left. Love to hear your thoughts on... It could be a both and. I don't know yeah. that they're necessarily mutually exclusive, and I think each community is going to be able to answer that question best for themselves. It depends on the track record of charter schools and if they already have so many. But I, th I think both can work and both should work. Well, you know, I, I, I work with a physicist who's a good friend of mine, and we actually talk a lot about our fields and what each one needs and sometimes what we need from each other. And he very often speaks about how he needs his students to be able to visualize what they're doing, and he also needs them to be able to express themselves um, in written form and to be able to communicate effectively. And so both of those things that he's talking about are things that come from the arts and the humanities. And so, you know, the physicists and the mathematicians, the engineers, they need it just as much as everybody else. 
Absolutely. And, and just using the tools of technology available to us, social media, et cetera, uh, never has there been a better integrative opportunity to bring people into uh, the mix of museums and to bring museums and cultural programming into the mix of teaching in the public schools or any schools or just at home into life. It's really quite, quite powerful. Larry and Todd, one of the illuminating moments for me was when I found out that uh, we had several people that were supporters of, our, of Spoleto that were tweeting, and they had 646 followers each. So if you got that person to talk about you on the Internet, you were reaching Absolutely. the yeah. multiplier effect was incredible. Sure. I'm gonna, I, we just got heated up. we got to go. <laughs> Thank you for steaming up the conversation. Appreciate having all of you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Fun. Major funding for Carolina Business Review was provided by the Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of North Carolina. Who's responsible for rising health care costs? Join us and many others in a candid discussion at letstalkcost.com. Grant Thornton, operating in more than 100 countries, our tax audit and advisory professionals specialize in helping companies unlock their growth potential. Novant Health, bringing you world-class technology, clinicians, and care when and where you need it. Sunoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of South Carolina, where healthcare is changing for the better. Find out how at ahealthysc.tv and by viewers like you. Thank you. Promotional consideration provided by Business North Carolina Magazine. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.com. <laughs>